Hey there. Well, um, I've done a lot of different messages, but I'm driving to my event and sorry, uh, thought I would keep teaching through Galatians. Um, I know it's a lot to catch up on, but for those who are tracking, uh, they are saying this is very helpful. So, uh, okay. So we're in Galatians 4, and now he's going to start talking about the difference uh, practically between those who walk in the flesh and those who walk after the Spirit. He's established that the Spirit is the blessing of the gospel, and the Spirit is the Spirit of sonship, and the Spirit is for the heirs, and they're already justified, and they can't be disqualified, right? And it's through, and that the whole thing operates by the hearing of faith. And then that produces a certain kind of living versus uh, those who walk according to the flesh, which is to be a uh, law keeper, you know, uh, someone who's under the curse. Um, now, as a believer, you could be brought under the curse of the law in the sense that it repels you from the presence of God. You know, there's two curses. Jesus became a curse for us, right? And he was crowned with thorns. And he became cursed to redeem those under the law, so the curse of the law fell on him. But also there's the curse of creation when Adam fell. Um, and that curse we all fell under whether we were under law or not. The law wasn't given till 1500, what, I, way, I'm sorry, way longer than that, 2,000 years later under Moses. But there was a curse when man was alienated from God and uh, women were bringing forth, you know, in sorrow and the ground is yielding thorns and thistles and man becomes mortal and he's sweating and he's having to earn a wage and fend for himself. He's like an orphan. And that's really where the spirit of bondage and fear came in. Uh, and weakness, you know. But that's all not because of our sins. That's because of Adam's sin. Romans 5 makes that clear that that curse came in and sin and death came in because of Adam's fall. And it came upon those who didn't even sin after the likeness of Adam because we're of Adam. And we were in Adam when he sinned, and, and therefore sin reigns over us all, right? Death through sin. So that's one kind of curse. But then there's the curse of the law. The curse of the law actually is for those who are not going out from the presence of God because they've fallen, but those who are trying to come near to God. The curse of the law, the law was given to the people of God, right? For transgression's sake. It wasn't given to the Gentiles. It wasn't given to mankind who was alienated from God, strangers from the covenants, were far away from God and had nothing to do with God. It was given to a group of people that believed God. And there's a curse of the law. And that curse is that you can't come forward and enjoy God in the holiest you're not qualified. That's basically it. It's for those who would come near to God based on their own righteousness. Uh, you know, if you don't come, if you're not the high priest and you don't come with the blood of the offering that was offered in the specific way by the priesthood in the way that God had ordained in accordance with how God said he justifies man for without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. If you try to come another way, there's a curse. It's like a double curse. Because you're cursed in the sense of Adam's fall, the original curse. Thorns and thistles and death and all that. But then, now God, now you've, you're trying to actually relate to God. You know God's real. And you're coming back to him. And he puts the law in place as a stumbling block to filter out those who would seek to be justified by their own merits, by their own righteousness. What does it mean to be justified? Ultimately, it means to have access to the inheritance, which ultimately is the Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, only the high priest had access to the Holy of Alls, 
but we've all been granted access to the holiest. But we have to come near, right? And how can we come near? In the Old Testament, the priest came near, and he was a figure of good things to come that we now stand in. Uh, he came near by the blood and through faith in the blood. I mean, he knew that if he went in there in a wrong way, he'd die. So he had to have some faith that bringing the blood was what God required and God wouldn't kill him because no one shall see my face and live. Well, we have access to the holiest of all. And for us, we have to come in by faith in Jesus Christ. We are brought to, to the blessing of the gospel. Justification brings us to the blessing, which is the spirit, which is the holiest of all, which the high priest had access to in a figure, but now we all have access to. But as we attempt to come to God, what principle are we coming by? Are we coming by the hearing of faith? Or are we seeking to be perfected in the flesh according to law keeping? And the law brings its own kind of curse, which is, no, you, you can't come in. The law stops you from bringing, being brought into the presence of God. It puts you back in the outer court and in the holy place and in weakness and in death and in condemnation and just reminder of sin. You know, all the labor in the outer court and in the uh, holy place, according to Hebrews, as long as all those offerings were being made, it just served as a reminder of sin. It didn't help their consciences. It reminded them of their sins. And that's what law righteousness really does is it makes you sin conscience, which just accentuates that you don't have God and you can't access him. It brings you under condemnation and into weakness and into servitude and into death, bondage and death. Versus the faith in the gospel, which says, even though I'm a sinner, I can be brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, and by that blood I am qualified to enjoy the blessing. And every day, we can be those who walk according to the flesh according to the, or according to the Spirit, by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law. We can either be those who walk by the Spirit, who believe and, and only deal with God based on the blood of his son Jesus Christ by faith and therefore enjoy the blessing or we can be those who do not believe that but attempt to come in another way by our own righteousness and for those the law is a stumbling block that brings them under the curse under condemnation and excludes them from the blessing in that moment so that's why I say as a saved person you can kind of be practically under the curse because you're not enjoying the presence of God. The presence of God is only enjoyed by faith in the blood. You don't get the presence of God by trying to seek your own righteousness. How did you receive the Spirit? Was by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Have, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? No. So that's what we're talking about. What does it look like then for people to live as those who are under the curse and disqualified, versus those who are under the blessing by faith. And he, he'll eventually use Ishmael and Isaac as examples of trying to do it in the flesh versus waiting on God in the spirit. And he's going to do that in this chapter a little later. But uh, we're not quite there. He says, uh, okay, he was saying, look, you desire to be brought into bondage again. You've received the spirit of the Son. You've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Therefore, you are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, an heir of God through Christ. That's identity truth. This is who we are now. In God's, in God's view, we are the heirs. Everything is ours. We are not just children. Remember he was saying, you know, when you're the, even the heir, if he's a child, is dealt with through governors and tutors, and we were under the law as a schoolmaster. But now that faith comes, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Why? Because we're sons of God through faith in Christ, and these are full qualified, full grown heirs. That's how God reckons us. We have all the rights and all the privileges. We're no longer servants. He says, How be it then? When you knew God, you did service unto them, which are by nature no gods. 
Uh, but now that you've known God, or rather have been known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements wherein do you desire to be in bondage? You observe days and months and feasts and, and uh, years. The, the, they had been tricked by the Judaizers into saying, hey, you have to be justified by law if you're going to if you're going to have the blessing and you want to be a Christian and you have and you want to have God in your life now, then you need to do it the way we've always done it, which is, you know, by law. And so that's what he means that they were observing the feasts. They were observing feasts, days and months and times and years. They were being brought into the sabbatical system. Okay. Uh, and he calls those the weak and beggarly elements. And he calls it bondage. He says, you desire to be in bondage again. Or you do desire to be brought into bondage. You're full-grown heirs. You're no longer servants. Now, think about this, because this is long before Hebrews was written. This is early on in the book of Acts, and yet Paul's already clear that the temple system is the picture. We are not under these ordinances. We have the fullness now. And that was a really, as we talked about, this is a really hard thing for early Jewish Christians to grasp that the temple in Jerusalem is done. You know, God ordained it. How can you say we're done with it? Well, the fullness of time came. God sent forth his son, and now you have the spirit. Where? In the temple? No, in your spirit. And you have access by faith every day to walk in the blessing of the gospel. So it's a really big deal and very impoverishing to go back to weak, what he calls weak and beggarly elements. The church is not subject to the feasts or the times and the calendars of Israel. And, you know, that kind of also puts to bed most of the rapture date speculating, which is based on Jewish feasts. No. The church is not subject to that program at all. We don't want to be observing those times <laughs> and seasons and years and be brought back into bondage. And it's interesting, 99.999% of the rapture speculators backload works into the gospel. They literally bring people into bondage. Even the ones that supposedly teach grace endorse ones that uh, preach law and castigate anyone who would contend for the gospel if their message or contending comes into conflict with one of their prophecy friends. They bring people into bondage. Um, but anyway, he says, I'm afraid of you lest I've bestowed labor on you in vain. The brethren, I beseech you be as I am. For I am as you are. You've not injured me at all. Now, I'm not sure what that means, actually. What I'm not sure what he's saying. You have not injured me at all. If anybody has insight into that, I'd be interested to see what you think. But he says, You know how through infirmity or weakness of the flesh I preached a gospel to you at first, and my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not or rejected, but received me as a messenger from God, or an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where then was the blessing? You spoke of or the sense of blessing or the blessedness it's the sense of blessing for I bear you record that it had been possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given to them to me am I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth they zealously affect you but not well that they may exclude you that you would affect them it's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing not only when I'm present with you okay my little children of whom I travail again in birth until Christ be formed into you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in you, uh, in doubt of you. Okay, what is he saying with all this? Uh, it, in contrast with the manipulators, the Judaizers are manipulators. And they the, to zealously affect, he says they zealously affect you. Right? That means they fawn all over you. They flatter you. They be, pretend to be more loving than they are. They put on, they love bomb you. But he says, 
it's so that they may exclude you. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. So he, in other words, they court you, they flatter you. And then once they get you convinced, okay, if I just follow these guys, I'm gonna be really in the end club. Then they exclude you so that you will then seek after them and start flattering them, which is what they really wanted in the first place. This is witchcraft. This is Remember, he started this in uh, Galatians 3 with who has bewitched you, right? Witchcraft is manipulating your perception to get you to do things that are against your own interest. And this reminds me of a church I went to. Every church I went to love bombed me at first, excluded me uh, once I was in, so that I would start seeking after them. And they... And they did that to everybody. And eventually the only people that were ever promoted in the church system were those who fawned all over the leaders. But it was through this kind of witchcraft. And that's what it is. Uh, manipulation. Manipulating your feelings. But the one church in particular I went to uh, was a reformed church. And the pastors were wolves. And they love bomb you when you came and then they eventually once you're like oh I love it here they treat me so well these are the real people of God this is where the sincere Christians are because they walk in love and I feel so good <laughs> then they say okay we're going to have a membership thing right and uh, now for me they didn't court me they knew I was pretty solid, and so they kind of left me alone. But my wife wanted to sign up membership thing so she could be on the worship team, and I was still not really clear in some respect back then. So they let me sign up, and I became a member, which is terrible. But um, there were people, new believers, who w they would not let become members until they cleaned up their life. And so new believers who were excited for the Lord who had come to been revived and because uh, and, and come to know the Lord wanted to be members of this church and they would have a meeting with the pastor and the pastor would who had love bombed them in would suddenly say no we can't let you be members right now you need to fix this situation you need to do that situation and are you tithing and there was all kinds of stuff required for them to be members now they didn't they didn't pursue me that way they just let me be a member but for the ones that they really love bombed, love bombed, and they'd left me alone, but the ones that they really poured that flattery sauce on, they excluded them. And it was to get, to turn the tables now, to get those people to start zealously seeking them and seeking their approval, and they hung membership out as a carrot, and as, you know, an exclusion as a stick. And then they did things like They'd have a church picnic that was members only. And there were half the church that wanted to go, but couldn't because they couldn't become members of this thing. It was sick. And the, they loved it. They loved doing this. This was an example of they zealously affect you that they may exclude you so that you'll zealously affect them. They want your praise. And so they give you a taste of what it could be like. Utopia. The pe nicest people I've ever met who flatter me and treat me better than anybody in my entire life. Oh, this is the family of God, right? And once they realize they've got you hooked on that, then they turn it off and they give you the cold shoulder. What is your response then? Well, you start seeking them. You start seeking their favor. And I've done that in other churches for years, seeking the favor of the pastors. And they were, <laughs> it was sick. That's the manipulation Paul's talking about. That, that gives you an idea into these people's character. Okay. Now Paul, in contrast, came to them in weakness. With a temptation in his flesh, whatever that is. That they didn't despise. But treated him as an angel of God. Receiving his message as from God. And he said, you had, where was that sense of blessing you had? Now this sense of blessing is gone. He's trying to bring them back to remembrance. Look, you've been bewitched by these people that seem so spiritual. And they laid all the flattery on you. And now you're seeking 
you're following years and dates and months and you're seeking to be brought into bondage and some of you are being circumcised. Why are they doing that? Well, because these guys started excluding them and saying, no, you can't have that love we gave you a taste of until you're in. Until And the only way to be in is to do what we say. By the way, you never earn that love back. I was in one cult where, it was a church, but, you know, they love-bombed everybody in. But I always noticed from the get-go that the people who'd been around for a while, the elders seemed really mad at. It's like, how come he is so nice to these new ones, but the ones who've been around for a long time, he's not? And I thought that they had done something terrible. Nope, that was just the way it was. Once you're no, once you're there, then they exclude you and put you on a perpetual carrot stick system, but you never get the carrot. Okay, that's a spiritual abuse, and that's what happens in most churches these days. But here in Galatia, the Judaizers were especially bad because a lot of them were false brethren, crept in unaware to bring people into bondage. They were actually pretending to be believers for the sake of destroying their faith. Out of, motivated out of a hatred like Cain. So it's even, you know, it's, it's worse than we can imagine. Especially considering they were physically circumcising themselves, which is a far more excruciating and life-altering than just signing a membership clause. Uh, and, and they're starting to observe the Jewish system of bondage, being brought into bondage. Well, he's comparing the way he came to them. He didn't come with the flattery. He didn't come with an impressive resume. He didn't come with, oh, he's so spiritual. No, he came in weakness and infirmity, and there was a temptation in his flesh that he didn't despise. Some people believe he had epilepsy. Others believe he had Tourette system, uh, Tourette syndrome. Who knows? It was some kind of temptation, which actually he mentioned in... Uh, Corinthians, he said he'd been given a thorn in the side, or in his flesh, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him. And I kind of think of it as all those persecutions he experienced everywhere he went. There were riots everywhere. But there was also something even closer to him than that. There was a messenger from Satan given to him so that he would not be tempted to be exalted because of the abundance of revelation. God gives his servants a weakness and, and has them operate in weakness sometimes. And remember in Corinthians, he said he's chosen the things that are foolish, the things that the world despises, the base things, uh, to bring to naught the wisdom of the wise and to bring to nothing the strength of the strong. Because in their wisdom and in their strength, they chose not to know God, so God chose to hide it in foolishness and weakness. And that's how Paul came to them. He's saying, look, there, remember when you were happiest? It was actually not when you were associated with super spiritual superheroes and trying to curry their favor. It was when you had to receive me in my weakness. And I was the one in need. And you would have given out your own eyes for me. But you received me as a messenger from God or an angel of God. But I believe as a messenger from God. It's the same word. Meaning you received my message as from God and where did that and you what did you have a sense of blessing what blessing was that the blessing of the gospel there was an outpouring of the spirit the refreshing comes with believing the gospel and many people start their Christian life with an outpouring of the spirit that came through the hearing of faith and then eventually come under the curse through the zealous people who affect them fawn all over them and then exclude them and put them in a system of carrot and stick law keeping to try to get their favor again. What happens? You lose the sense of blessing. He's reminding them of that sense of blessing that they had with the Spirit, which he's already said comes to the hearing of faith and not by the works of the law. And he's pointing to the fact that the reason you lost it is because you're going after these people who zealously affected you and flattered you and made you feel like you were getting your needs met. But do you remember that the real sense of blessing came when someone came to you who was in need and didn't give you anything for your flesh? That was when you really had the sense of blessing. And he's trying to get them to contrast their sense of this outpouring of the Spirit and that joy they had with this 
misery they're now in, even though they think it's really awesome that the super spiritual people from Jerusalem have deigned to give them their attention. You know, it's amazing what people will sacrifice for status in a church system. They'll sacrifice their blessing, their identity, their position as an heir, and they will grovel before the feet of the super minister, the super pastor, if they think that that means that they'll eventually get a spot on the worship team. <laughs> Believe me, I know from personal experience. So that's what he's talking about. That's being a slave of man. Uh, and that's the beginning of their walk in the flesh. It was from flattery. Watch out. You know, this really applies to the current situation because that group that refuses to recognize us by our testimony traffics in flattery to court people and fawn all over them. And that's why one of the reasons people are attracted to them is because they get this dopamine hit from the flattery. Oh, I love you so much. You are so awesome, you know precious sister, precious brother, all that kind of lingo. But eventually they're excluded. The one guy that has made himself the focus of a lot of attention right now and is painting himself as the victim, that's what he always does, by the way. He paints himself as a victim, garners the sympathy of a bunch of people who've never heard of him, and raises the situation, drama to the situation... Uh, enough that the whole community is now staring at him and then he completely throws a fit backloads works into the gospel reveals what he really believes and then a week later takes his channel down and erases all his videos waits a month and starts all again it happens again and again and again and again <laughs> he's a mani master manipulator but uh, he, you know sometimes these Judaizing types will come to you fawning all over you uh, pretending to be the one in need and this guy comes he, he will email you like I got an email from him once that seemed to be genuinely he's genuinely struggling with the lust of the flesh and how to overcome it he's trying to get a hold of my teaching on sanctification by faith and he sent me an email and asked me a couple questions and I answered and within a day, he was doing an explosive exposed video on me, railing against me, and lying about what I said. And I watched him do that to other people too. He went to another sister and said in an email, I really struggle with the assurance of salvation. I just don't even know how to know I'm saved, you know. And you feel so sorry for the guy. He seems to be genuinely struggling. But I already been through the ringer with him. So I told her, look, I wouldn't give your attention. I would not open up to him. But she thought, well, I can help. She got him in a chat room with a couple other people. Within a couple days, he was out doing railing videos about her, turning the community against her. He approaches you seeming to be in need, like a sheep. You know, but he's a wolf. And he devours, and he turns people against each other, and then he shuts them out, and then he rails on them. You know, that's the same kind of thing. This is what zealously affecting is. It is, I'll use whatever charm, charisma, religious uh, zeal, whatever, whatever gets you to think that you being associated with me will help you spiritually or help me spiritually but then I'll I, that's just a prelude to the damage I'm going to do and that's what these remember these Judaizers in many cases were false brethren crept in aware unaware specifically deliberately seeking to spy out their liberty and bring them into bondage they had, a, they had an agenda and they would use anything to do it and Paul called it witchcraft that's what we're watching. I thought I'd bring it up because it's very, it is relevant. It's a little different, but it's the same thing. Um, all of those YouTube channels that rail against us traffic and flattery as a way to win people over. 
and and play on their sympathies and they emotionally manipulate them and that's what Paul's talking to look they're manipulating you emotionally they're zealously affecting you but they're going to exclude you if they haven't already so that you'll zealously affect them and then you will throw away your liberty uh, for their approval um, okay, I'm at my destination now. Uh, that's kind of what he's saying there. There's not a lot of meat in there, nothing too spiritual, but I had to get through that little section before I could get to talking about Ishmael and Isaac. All right, take care.